Section 3, A Collection of Personal Stories. Chapter 42, Letters from the E.T. Journal. In the following pages, you'll find some of the letters and stories that have appeared in the E.T. Journal over the past few years, coming from subscribers across the U.S. and several other lands these selections reveal a range and depth of paranormal experience and the most intimate personal process of coming to grips with cosmic identity, life purpose, and spiritual awakening. My Shocking Self, New England I picked up your book about three weeks ago. This was strange in and of itself, as I was actually reaching for a different book, and generally I avoid the subject of ETs like the plague but I was distracted by my son and ended up buying your book instead. So I read it. My first shock came when I met almost all of your criteria to be an ET, including being a disinterested scientific sort who intends to finish one's physics degree once all the kids are in school. Still, I was skeptical. Anyone could have many of these symptoms you describe. So when I finished reading your book, I said to myself, yeah, sure, and tried not to let the little gnawing feeling that I had disturb me any more. The very next day, I went to a friend's house to chant, as I'm a Buddhist. Out of the blue, my very stable, normal friend sat me down to tell me that she is from another planet, and she believes that I am too. I couldn't believe my ears. What's worse was that I knew she was right, though I'm still having a rough time with the idea. Now, for the past week, every day, someone has had something to tell me about ETs, UFOs, and aliens. Even a complete stranger in McDonald's told me about his own experience. So, now I'm crying, Uncle. It's obvious someone wants me to know something. Are you having a good giggle yet? Well, it's just too incredible for me. It all culminated last night when I found out two other very well-grounded friends of mine are from other planets. I'm about ready to take a poll of everyone I know, just to be sure. My own story is this. I was born a natural psychic, and since I had a great-grandfather who was also psychic, no one seemed to think that my own gift was strange. In fact, my great-grandfather encouraged it while he was still alive. Once I found out being psychic was a problem, I tried very hard for many years to squelch it. When I was little... I saw someone or something just lurking in my peripheral vision much of the time. I also had the same repeating dream, in which I was going down a long, sterile white corridor and bumping into faceless people. I've always been completely fascinated by space, sci-fi, and fantasy. Rocks, geology, minerals all have a special place in my heart, too. I have one year of my physics education behind me, and I've always loved science. I like logic things I can see, touch, taste, or sense. I've always believed in my ET experience that if it exists, it hasn't been very good, and that that's why I try to avoid the subject. Besides all of this, I've been through some truly hellacious years, courtesy of my ex-husband. At the height of my frustration, I sat down on my bed and just cried and cried. In the middle of my tears, I said the strangest thing, please take me home, these people aren't worth saving. At the time, I just shrugged it off as grief and exhaustion, but now I see it a little differently. So on the one hand, I'm wondering if my sanity has finally snapped, but on the other, I'm feeling more calm and natural than I have in a couple of years. My Story, Seattle, Washington I just finished from elsewhere and feel compelled to write. One reason is that I recognized all sorts of pieces of my life in the book but never put them together to form my story. In 1981, through co-workers, I became a part of a metaphysical group led by a channeling teacher that met weekly. One night, I was told that I was a walk-in. My immediate reaction, which seems strange now, was to cringe with a feeling of being exposed. But it made sense in that this previous person had spiraled down in a marriage of continual domestic violence, drugs and alcohol, it seems it was a gradual change, but the first change was the disinterest in and cessation of using drugs. The alcohol took a few more years to stop, but I also took the big, all-consuming plunge into metaphysics, ETs, and so on. I quickly put the whole walk-in thing aside, because I seemed to fall into an ego trap, feeling very special. This is no longer a concern, but it seems your book has come to me at a great time of need. 
feels like it's vital to accept and embrace this aspect of my identity to understand the feelings that still create difficulties for me. There have been two family experiences that stand out after having read your book. The first is that I know all the family stories, but only the ones that are often repeated to company and relatives told over and over at gatherings. It's as if these are the only memories which were passed on in the walk-in transfer. My mother often says, remember when this or that happened, and I have no recollection of what she's talking about. It feels uncomfortable when she says, you don't remember that? And I only say vaguely, when I went back to Ohio for my parents' 40th anniversary party, an aunt, just out of the blue, said, so where do you fit in, in this family? You don't seem to fit. This was not to be pursued, since my mother was so offended that she jumped up and said, of course he fits. I also have had many dreams, and one epochal dream. Some were dreams of being on spaceships. One was like going to the dentist. But I knew I was on a spaceship and felt very comfortable getting in the chair. It was like a checkup. Another dream was in the library of a teacher on a ship who had a window or a screen through which you could see space and stars, and I could walk through it into whatever he wanted to show and teach. I've had dreams of zooming through space, and once I was on a planet where the ground was a translucent indigo, a non-earthly color, and the sky was translucent orange. It wasn't home, but I had been there before. My epoch dream, I call it this because upon awakening I felt as though it was of biblical proportions in my life, was in 1983. In it, I was in a flat terrain with a very large old tree nearby. I see all the birds fly away in the same direction. Then there is incredible stillness, and suddenly there are tremendous winds. I knew these were winds of change in the dream, I took refuge in a gully while the winds blew over the land. When they ceased, I got up. A man in sheepskin and I led a group of people to a large building where there were ETs in human form. It was decided to have a Christmas pageant that night, so we all sang Silent Night like the birthing of the Christ within. The next morning, we all got into little boats propelled through channels of turquoise water. The strange sensation was that the water went uphill and at the top there were two very tall aliens who had us then get out. There were two to a boat, and if you were on the left you got out and went left. I was on the right, and so I got out to the right. This right and left seemed to be going in different directions to do different things, like moving on. I feel like I've been drifting these last three years. These years have been a great opportunity, meaning deep, painful learning, to learn to be alone and deal with all the issues everyone on the planet has to work through. Sometimes this feels like the dregs of the previous soul, including depression compounded by familiar feelings of not fitting in. Ultimately, I agree that in the bigger picture it doesn't matter if you're a wanderer or walk-in. We're all here together, now. Reading your book gave me a sense of relief and understanding. By accepting and integrating that aspect of myself, I can stop wondering if I'm weird and move ahead in the job that needs to be done. I'm not alone, Washington State. For many years, I've searched for others like myself in vain. I found myself meeting with outright ridicule, disbelief, misunderstanding, and even outright threats. Yet I knew there were other ETs out there. Humans in such disguise rarely talk openly about such subjects for their own fear of retaliation, both social and realistic. At last, with your book, I realize that there are in fact others out there who believe, like me, that their origins lie beyond the realm of Terra. I experienced quite a rude shock to my system at the age of five years old when I suddenly came to the realization that I do not belong here and everything in fact looked and acted differently than I remembered them. To say the least, this offered a profound outlook on Earth and humans in general and that has survived in entirety to this day. It has manifested in so many greater ways than I could ever imagine. Growing up in such an atmosphere was quite a challenge when I knew things that were not supposed to be, and often openly said things that were not supposed to be said. I struggled for many years with this fact, and later gave in during my teenage years of the 60s, and relatively conformed to society as best I could. All the while, I was in constant contact with beings that I knew were not of this realm. 
After taking it all in stride over the last few years, I have become quite used to this idea and have openly accepted it. Given the changes to this planet that I know are coming soon, I openly welcome it. I have amassed a great deal of knowledge over the years from my ET brothers, and perhaps there's some part of this that I could pass on to others. Perhaps, in some small way, this is my life purpose on this planet, and that's why I have been imparted such information. However, up to this point, it's been rather hard to expound on the subject. Waking up in 3D, Washington State. My primary recall of being from elsewhere, downloaded for the most part in 1979. Included therein was awareness of and knowing about various levels of intergalactic councils, ancient wars in our solar system that continue to underlie deep tensions, shrouded ETs manifesting here, thinking of themselves human, numerous past lives, and impending big work that would commence about now. I guess that summarizes it, except to say that shortly thereafter, or maybe in the midst of waking up, I met my now ex-husband, an event which plunged me into a long period of darkness, struggle, and confusion. Over the years with my husband, I occasionally channeled a presence called Iratu, whom I now believe to possibly be an aspect of myself hailing from Mars. I also suspect that the difficulties with my now ex-husband stemmed from interplanetary or maybe intergalactic wars, the sum of which probably resulted in a sort of karmic shackling here, or something like that. He was never able to hear the stuff about interplanetary warfare, and thus the information remains unexplored at this point, except that I now more fully understand my frustration with his seemingly inept questioning during these sessions. I was aware that the channeling was a ruse on my part, an attempt to try and get the information that was actually accessible consciously, but maybe the Iratu presence felt a need to make her presence known, or whatever. In recent years, Having read and heard myriad distortions of what I'd been shown nearly 20 years prior, I'd begun to feel that my awakening was all just a gigantic ruse. What I'd long kept in trust was now being blithely referred to by the most unawakened, uninspiring, unimpressive people imagining. Ye gad! All this great truth I'd been given reduced to the equivalent of bathroom graffiti, scrawled by moronic ne'er-do-wells selling their wares to even less awakened masses of humanity. So, well, then I figured I must have been nuts to have been given any credibility at all to those earlier experiences. Obviously, I'd only tapped into the hallucinations of mass consciousness induced by millennial fever. No big deal. Life goes on. May as well plan for my retirement. I should live so long, God forbid. A near-death experience, Washington State. My near-death experience was in 1965, when I know I died and came back, but only after I was shown that it was important that I return, though I really didn't want to come back here. In my mid-teens, I worked on a ranch during the summer in Colorado, just west of Steamboat Springs. This place was 2,000 acres of pure beauty. I worked for an elderly man, and I loved every minute of it. It all happened one sunny day. I don't recall if it was morning or afternoon. My stepsister and I were heading toward a large pasture at the back portion of this ranch. She was riding her own horse, and I was on a stallion I'd been training. We were looking for some underweight cows when my sister spotted them in the distance, and we decided to race to the other end of the pasture, which was a bad decision. I had just gotten up to speed when the horse stepped into a gopher hole. I saw his front go down, and the only thing that came to my mind was, Please, God, don't let his legs break. As I saw the ground racing up toward me, I just blanked out, lost all consciousness and awareness, and everything just went black. The next thing I knew, I saw myself on my back, floating in a gray, cloudy tunnel, moving toward a white light. Then I was lying on my back, in a half-sitting position, and was looking at who I knew to be God himself. He was sitting on a white throne, clothed in white robes, and a brilliant pure white, but not blinding light, was in front of his face. As I lay there, I could sense and feel three beings behind me, working on the back of my head. And when I tried to turn around to see them, one of them said, Lie still. Don't turn around. You cannot see us. You're not supposed to know what we look like. So I did as they asked, 
and the atmosphere there was one of incredible or indescribable joy, love, peace, and contentment, and then everything made sense. I wanted to stay, and so I begged the Creator to let me stay, and He was going to. In no time, the three beings were finished and gone. As I lay there, He showed me the earth, seeing it as from an orbit, but much further away. I said, What of the earth? What is going to happen to it? He said, This is why you have to go back. And I said, Okay. And I was back in my body on the ground. As I came to more fully, I saw the pickup coming to a stop and the man I was working for running over to me. He looked surprised to see me awake and asked if I was all right, and I was getting to my feet then. I asked him how the horse was, since I was so afraid that he'd broken a leg, but he was just fine. Then I said that I was fine, and that it was just a slight headache and a little dizziness. There was no blood or bruising anywhere on me, just some dust. He helped me into the truck and drove to the far end of the range pasture up to a spring. There we got out, and I helped myself to a large drink of cold water. As we were returning back to the ranch house, he kept watching me for signs of passing out, but all I could do was think about where I had been and longing to return to that place of loving peace and contentment. But it all turned out fine, and upon arriving back at the barn, I immediately checked out the horse to convince myself that all was right. Then I got back on and rode after the cows once again, not having a second thought about the fact that I had died not more than an hour before. It all seemed so normal to me, so matter of fact. A few days later, I found out from my stepsister exactly what had really happened. She said that the horse went down knee-deep into a hole, I flipped over his head, and the horse rolled on top of me, pushing the saddle horn into the back of my head. The horse jumped up, barely missing walking on top of my body and head, when my sister arrived at my side. She said that my head looked caved in, and she almost fainted and then she rode back to the barn to get help. This whole experience left me totally inspired with love, faith, and trust in our infinite creator, and now I have no fear of dying, I guess, because I know now what's there. I can't wait to go back. Faith and goodness, Norway. I cannot help seeing all as light. There really is no evil, because all is within God, and he is light. We only perceive evil as a reflection of our own earthly minds and our own darker sides. If we look behind a so-called evil being, discarnate or incarnate, there is a divine being. A friend told me the other day, irritably, All you see is love and light. You are blind. Just look around you, open your eyes, and see all the horrible things happening. Which she said to me after giving me a regression, and stupidly I trusted her, which got me hurt, I told her that I get my portion of evil through the TV and the newspaper, and it's all around me where I live. I live in the poorest and most polluted part of Oslo, Norway. Fifty percent of people living around me are drug addicts, alcoholics, glue sniffers, and worse, and also there are a lot of very old and poor people. I don't focus on it, that's all. I just try to transform all this sadness by always being as close to being love as I can. In my book, I say, only through the eyes of love do we see what is real, all else is an illusion. The ultimate goal, to me, would be to look at everyone with the eyes that Christ looked at his neighbor. He saw no fault in anyone because he did not recognize it. He had none himself. I think we are all extraterrestrials on Earth. When Earth was first populated, we all came from somewhere else. Or, only now, in time and space, is there this rush of evolved souls coming in from higher dimensions or planets to help propel Earth to a higher state of consciousness and ultimately lift Earth into a higher dimension? I think the most important task is to work with our inner selves and egos and to live all those beautiful thoughts we gain on our path. What do all those new loving thoughts help if they're locked inside us? What good does it do if we turn our back on or step over a beggar or a needy person in the streets without at least sending a blessing to this person? I have sailed through some pretty tough times and have come out of it all and then still believe in people and the world. Trouble with Gravity, Florida I recently purchased your book and was so thrilled to find such validation in what I had believed to be my own strange reality for so long. I'm a wanderer, and I've known this, though not always consciously, all my earthly life. 
From the time I was young, I was the black sheep of the family and always a loner. I rarely felt comfortable with humans, even hiding from company that came to visit. I gravitated to animals and felt closely bonded to nature. School was difficult. I remember being very young, perhaps second grade, and thinking, "I can't believe how immature and stupid these beings are." Teachers always commented on how quiet and well behaved I was. I had a high IQ, but I felt that school, in the traditional sense, was a waste of time for me. I felt there were more important things for me to be doing. Besides having difficulties adjusting to people and school, I had problems adapting to my environmental limitations. For example, when I was two, I rode my tricycle down two flights of stairs, convinced I should just glide along the air and land safely. But I didn't. I ended up with a fractured skull and a lot of bruises. But I was determined not to give up. Something was not right. So when I was about four, I leaped off a staircase, landing in our house. And again, found out this Earth had its physical restrictions. I decided the Earth's gravity was too strong for me, and even today, I sometimes find myself feeling pulled down with a dragging sensation. I also used to say that the sky was the wrong color; it should be a lavender-like purple. Most folks thought that I was just weird. I was usually quiet and shy, and opened up only to a few people. But parts of me were expressed through my creativity, including a cartoon character I developed called Squack. Squack was from another planet and was not male or female, but rather an it. I also wrote science fiction. Feeling different, Minnesota. I've always felt different, and I never fit in. A lot of my friends, if not all, and family, thought that I was a little strange. They just kind of put up with me. I was always reading science fiction and dreaming of other planets. Star Trek was one of my favorite shows, but I'm not a Trekkie. My brothers and I spent lots of time pretending we were traveling to other planets. My brother and I were always asking my mom, "Please tell us we're adopted." We would beg her and cry about it. Our father was not too nice, and we were sure he wasn't our real father. While most kids were afraid that they were adopted, we wanted to be told that we were. We just knew we had to be. As a child, I used to watch the stars a lot and look for UFOs. I'm basically kind-hearted and peaceful. The birds in town even come to our house and our yard when they're sick and need help. Once, a pigeon with a broken wing curled up on our step where we found her when we opened the door one morning. She was cold and almost dead. We took her in, and she lives with us now and doesn't want to leave. Somehow, she knew that we would help her. Neither my mother nor I are very interested in money or possessions. When we get too many things around us, it upsets us, and we have to keep our things to a minimum amount, where it doesn't feel that we don't have enough space. I definitely have a hard time recognizing evil and trickery in advance. I've been in some bad relationships, which I could have avoided had I been able to tell that they were fake and not nice people. And I used to drive my mother crazy, and still do, trying to figure out why. Why do people do this? Why does this happen? Etc. Etc. And so I've always felt different, like I didn't fit in. Feeling bonkers, Pennsylvania. Your book from elsewhere was lent to me by a male friend who said, and I quote, "I bought this on a whim, but I think it's meant for you. Maybe it will help you feel better about being alive at this time." I've read a lot of books and I've searched for meaning for so many years, but after reading and rereading your book. I have determined that I am indeed a wanderer, but a very restless one. I'm sure your book will reach countless thousands. It's quite clear to me that many need it, especially the ones who found life so difficult and can't quite find their niche, nor have they ever felt comfortable anywhere, nor nor with anyone. After a highly dramatic 21-year marriage to an emotional abuser that produced four fine children, I now understand why we married in the first place and why I had to end it. My husband often commented that I just thought differently than most people. Translation: He's very connected to Earth, but I am not. He's a warrior, an ex-Marine Corps and left brain physician who believes only what he sees. While I am not only proficient in accounting, but also believe in spirit guides, universal healing energy, and all the subtleties that most people don't recognize. I also believe that Earth is a massive experiment, both the planet itself and its inhabitants. I never taken anything too seriously because it's much too easy to do so, and when one does, one loses perspective and vision. 
Therefore, your ideas make sense, and I know I'm not bunkers. An early child's memory. My life on the moon, quadrex juxi. I like my life. Things are modern here. I live in Luna City, quadrix juxi. My job is washing the tip of the skyscraping. I have to make sure that the moon has enough water. It's real. Yes, my life is great, except one thing. Quadrix doesn't have enough water. So we drink carnation instant non-fat dry water. It's shipped in from a strange planet called Earth, one of the newest planets. This planet is so behind the times that it isn't even funny, and they think that they are so modern. Ha! We discovered that 223 light years ago. I have a mexolix called Splikix. A mexolix is something like a dog. He's really smart, and he has the sharpest ears in 224 galaxies. Why, he can hear an imported butterfly 82.5 miles away. A Life on Mars, New Hampshire. I recently finished reading your first book and found it to be very interesting. The personal stories were both fascinating and oftentimes far out, especially those of the walk-ins. My story is not as dramatic and fits the profile of a wanderer. From a very early age, I was aware of and fascinated by the stars, outer space, and science fiction. I remember being only three or four years old and watching Lost in Space. I also did have one weird experience, or at least I have a memory trace of it. When I was six or so, after looking up at the moon, I felt that for a second I was actually on the moon. I had this strange sense of bilocation, or having my awareness far removed from my body. It didn't last long, but it left an impression. As a child, I definitely felt different from the normal children, and I had a very vivid imagination. I usually chose space themes for my drawings and art class. I definitely had a feeling that people here make life a lot more difficult than it should be. I was horrified by the Vietnam War and by many other realities of the adult world. I wondered if I would ever fit in. As an older child and teenager, I read a lot of science fiction, and still do, and picked up astronomy as a hobby. I love to speculate about other worlds, and I became very scientifically minded, especially in high school and early college, and I tended to favor speculation and science fiction with a basis in scientific fact. This changed a bit after a few mind-expanding experiences in college and my encounter with Buddhism. In 1986, I encountered a possible alien artifact on a magazine cover that set the stage for my gradual awakening as a sleeping wanderer, the face on Mars. From that day forward, I've devoted a lot of time and energy into learning as much as I could about Cydonia, the area of Mars with these structures. I started corresponding with one of the researchers, and after this, I opened up a little more and told him of a very vivid, almost lucid dream I had in 1976 when the Viking spacecraft was just getting to Mars. In the dream, I was living on Mars, and some sort of unseen threat was lurking just beyond the horizon, threatening the existence of the fragile colony we had started there. The researcher said my dream contained elements of both my present life and a distant past life on Mars as one of the Altians about 200 to 300,000 years ago. He even told me that my past life name was something and that I had an integral part to play in events here at the end of the Altian stay on Mars. I was supposedly in the Altian Navy and piloted one of their flying disks, and as a kid and a teenager, I often fantasized about having my own flying saucer. I take all of this as interesting information, and I certainly don't let it get to my head. I don't have any clear memories of this past life. However, some of the story does seem intuitively right on, and would certainly explain my complete fascination with Cydonia. In my heart of hearts, I'm sure these objects are artificial, and I have a strong intuition that several of my past lives were as an alien. An adult in a child's body, Los Angeles. Since I was little, I always felt totally different from my other three siblings. In fact, I can even see it from photos when we were younger. They always seemed to form a separate unit from me. I was often convinced that I was adopted, and often they did not like me and envied me for making such and such remarks, as if I was an adult, and for understanding my parents in an adult way. I also remember that I didn't talk until I was about three or four years old. My mother thought that I was deaf, actually. 
I remember very clearly, though, that I was thinking in adult words and ways inside my head, but was too scared to talk like that. Once I finally got to hang out with small kids of my age and observe them, I was able to figure out how to act as a child. It was then that I got the courage to start talking. My mother was shocked and totally surprised, because not only was I talking like a much older child, word-wise, but I also started talking and talking and didn't have to learn first any words. I often felt like an adult, locked inside a child's body, because I would understand so many things about my parents and other adults, the wars, the peace, the world, etc., already at that age. And I would correct and support my parents often by giving them advice and getting angry at them like a teacher when they were behaving like kids and affecting their relationship negatively. That all was when I was between four and fourteen years old. They would always look at me as the adult of the entire family, who, in some ways, was taking care of them and the other siblings. There was a very special thing that happened to me when I was little. I used to keep the window of my room open almost all day and night, except in the winter, since Rome, Italy, is cold at that time of year. I would constantly talk to God and to beings that only I could visualize. I was very worried about the world and its future, and was at five years old already furious at all these political parties, fights, and problems. I hated wars and quarrels because it seemed so idiotic to me and a total waste. I was amazed at how people, even those in my family, were often unable to leave each other alone and would get upset about things that I'd never be upset about or which I would rather just forget for the sake of peace and getting something done. Around those years, I think I was five or six years old, one night I had a very intense dream. Actually, it didn't feel like a dream. It felt like a real experience somewhere else. I remember a very nice orange, yellow, red light and a very caring warmth around me and in me. I found myself suddenly surrounded by tons and tons of beings, angelic beings and people from all over the world and someone way up there filled with light who was talking to me while laughing heartily at the same time. I remember realizing, or at least feeling, that this must be God, or at least the one that takes care of me and always listens to me and at times talks to me. He was so pleased in seeing me and talked in tongues. The whole scene went on for a while, and what surprised me was that the entire world and other worlds were watching and laughing as well in a very genuine way. I was so happy there and never wanted to leave. I was trying to convince him to keep me there because the world was such a dark, unhappy place anyway. I was told that no, I had to go back and take care of this world and that the peace that I had envisioned and desired so much was possible and that it needed me. To my great surprise, I felt like he literally took me or some gentle force took me and lifted me back down into my bed and then suddenly it got very dark even though it was the morning with plenty of light, the weather was gorgeous and the sun was shining. In spite of the daylight, the world still felt dark and depressing when I came back from the experience. I kept begging him not to leave me here because I was terribly lonely and afraid in this world. Plus, I always felt like a total stranger in my own family. But I heard that I had to do something here first, which made me very sad and made me start crying for a while. It all looked so gray and dark here in comparison to what I had just seen and felt. I remember while I was looking up from my bed and making sure I was really back at home, how much I kept wishing that it wasn't true. I felt so terribly lonely that day, and for years I would automatically start crying when remembering this event because I missed him and that whole place so much. Today, and especially lately, I've come to the conclusion that this experience might have been a pre-announcement of what is coming and my having to play a certain role in it. Back to basics, Massachusetts. In my life, there appears to be a pattern of my being unable or unwilling to develop either spiritually in religious community or develop spiritually by following prescribed religious practices. It appears that I proceed best along my own spiritual path when stumbling along alone with just the least bit of help from fellow pilgrims. Much of my previously developed and hard-earned faith has dropped away, leaving me with simple affirmations. I affirm life. I affirm living. I affirm the fragment of God that is within me and in us all. I affirm the grace of God that continues to spring up. I believe that matter changes form 
from solid to invisible to solid to invisible, i.e. birth and death, but that there really is no death in a final sense. I believe in the original one that encompasses all time, all matter, all space, all creatures, all universes, the one that pre-existed everything and will remain one after all manifestation has become unmanifest again. Being Sensitive, Arizona First of all, let me say I know I am a wanderer. Reading your book confirmed what I had always suspected. As a child, I really did believe that I was from another planet. I felt like I was lost here and that I had three brothers here who I was also lost from and that our parents lived far away on another planet. Where I got that idea, I have no clue because I wasn't yet watching Star Trek and shows about outer space. By the time I was about ten, I had made up names for my missing brothers, parents, and my home planet. At night, I would make up stories in my mind about being with my brothers and parents. I never told anyone about these secret stories or my secret beliefs, but in school I draw pictures of spacecrafts and planets on my desk, and in my notebooks I drew pictures of my missing brothers and parents. I think I lived more in my daydream world than I did in reality. I've never felt like I wanted to be here. If I have been here since Atlantis, incarnating every now and then, then it's no wonder that I'm sick to death of being here and just want to go home. Perhaps back then I came to Earth willingly, but I get the distinct feeling that this incarnation was somehow forced on me. In the past 15 years I've considered suicide many times, I'm 35 now, and would have done it except that I was afraid of what would happen to my sweet little pets if I were to leave them. Reading from elsewhere answered my questions about why I've always felt so alienated and out of place, but it didn't make me feel like I had a new interest in being here. Perhaps I do have some kind of mission, but I think it's too late for me now, because life has hurt me so horribly that I believe my soul or spirit is damaged beyond repair. My physical mind seems to be working okay, but something in my soul feels very, very messed up, almost as if my soul is starting to go slightly insane. You see, I'm a very sensitive person, and also quite psychic, and every little act of cruelty that I see done to a living thing makes me hurt terribly. This is not something I've developed, but rather the way I've always been. And I've tried to stop so hard from being so sensitive, but nothing works. Wounding and Protection, Illinois I've had post-traumatic stress syndrome, PTSD, from being abused as a child, and I believe that PTSD, as well as a lack of love, opens a psychic door for a person to be assaulted demonically or by negative ETs, and they may be the same. I've also had PTSD, I believe, from past lives in fighting negative ETs off Earth. Are all these negative manifestations simply projections of our own minds mirroring to us as individuals and society our inner natures? If all is one, and the one is the creator, and the creator is unconditional love, then the evil and negative ETs are just as much a part of the creator as we are, aspects of the same that haven't matured or been enlightened yet. Yes, we must defend ourselves. Loving each other unconditionally is a good defense as well as an example for them to learn from, though they don't learn easily. Unconditional love is not easy for me with PTSD and apparent negative ET assaults, nor is trusting of other people, nor even unconditional love itself. The End of Seattle, Washington State When my husband and I were driving to his doctor in Seattle one sunny day, I was watching the sights and scenery pass by when suddenly I heard a voice say, This is what's coming. Suddenly, I was seeing total and complete devastation of the entire city of Seattle and some of the surrounding area. I felt as though I were in two different space times watching a movie and moving through it at the same time and seeing flashes of the present, but I wanted to see this incredible sight. I was very frightened and had to grip my jeans leg as I watched in horror. I saw buildings toppled like trees one upon another, while others were broken off halfway up. Cars and trucks toppled, crushed, and piled in heaps. Streets were blocked with debris, and bridges collapsed on roadways, which seemed strange to see as we passed right through it as though it weren't there. I knew it was only a vision, but still it was incredible. 
I saw the huge bridge that spans what used to be Interstate 5 collapsed into Union Lake, along with all the other ones. Not one remained standing. It was unnerving to pass over these fallen bridges and looking down and not seeing anything but a wrecked bridge in the water below. I looked at my husband and wanted to tell him about all of this, but he's having some major medical problems, and I didn't want to lay anything as unreal as what I was seeing upon him. Every time after that, when we went to Seattle for three weeks, I kept seeing the exact same thing all over again, moving through the same movie again. It took some doing to see it for what it was, a vision and nothing more. But as if that weren't enough, at home, at night, as I lay in bed, or even was doing something around the house, I started wondering if Seattle was the only city to be destroyed. I had to ask. Well, I saw Tacoma destroyed along with Portland, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. As if that weren't all, as we were traveling to Spokane a few days later, I was watching the rolling grain fields and then suddenly these miles of rolling hills started undulating as waves in the ocean. I asked myself and whoever else was around watching me, why? The response I received was, you must know, which didn't tell me much, but I accepted it. One thing I noticed was when I was seeing all this devastation was that I saw no people. Days later, when I asked why, the reply was, it's not for us to know who survives and who does not, that is left only to the Creator. I was relieved because I didn't want to know. A Vision of the Future, Iowa In my last hypnosis session, I asked that I be progressed to see what the future might bring. I went to the year 2016, and I was 60 years old. I was standing on a grassy plain, and I could see for miles. There seemed to be fields of glowing energy surrounding me and the earth, and somehow I knew that this was the auras of the peoples of the world, and that they were vibrating in sync with the planet, and somehow nourishing it. It was a beautiful sight to behold. Then I was standing in a huge white mansion with a ceiling that was multiple stories high. Everything was white, and there seemed to be a wonderful white light encircling me. I knew this was my house, and marveled how beautiful it was. Later, I left my house and went up on a path to a nearby mountain. At the top, I could see for miles, and I was surrounded by the vivid green of the life on our planet Earth. I scrambled to the top of a huge granite rock and sat down to meditate, which I did daily. As my mind cleared, I started to feel my body vibrating faster and faster, and I found myself in another dimension. I faced this white energy in the shape of a pyramid, and suddenly beams of light shot out from the top and the bottom of the pyramid and hit me in the stomach and forehead. Somehow, I knew this was a process of renewal of energy in me to build up my strength for my work. After this meditation was done, I looked into the sky and saw a grid of energy that encircled the earth. This grid was a communication network of a unified field of love that is in sync with the planet and its people. Every person contributes a piece of this energy to the grid, as I do too. I now realize that this grid is in the process of construction right now, and more and more people are contributing to its completion. When I relax my mind, I can sense the increase of energies, and I can feel the force of my uppermost chakra reaching into space to help create this field of love and unity.